and our first speaker has joined me. This is Teresa Schultz, and uh, she's an example of what happens when, how much uh, the whole community is affected when any particular person goes to prison. Teresa is the daughter of a most extraordinary man who's been behind bars for 40 years in circumstances that she'll tell you about. I, I went to see him three or so days ago and the night I left him, I didn't sleep mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was a bit traumatized with the fact that I formed the Wages for Housework campaign 40 years ago. This is month is the 40th anniversary and I realized that all those 40 years he has been inside and mm -hmm. it was too much for any human being to bear and to know that he is bearing the fact that he's inside was unbelievable. I, I think that we have to know that prison is part of society. It's not other than society. And if you see somebody inside, you know that in a way you're inside too. Mm -hmm. And that it's your business to find out how inside prison you are and what to do about it. So Teresa has been a struggler and her father has a lot of confidence in her ability to get him out and to work with other people who will help her and so do I, mm -hmm. Teresa. Hi. Mm -hmm. So I am the daughter of Russell uh, Maroon Shokes and he's fast approaching 70 years old and he's been in solitary confinement for more than 30 years now. Mm -hmm. um, outside of his ability to lead behind bars, um, I think what the prison has done is taking this years with him behind in solitary confinement to study him also mm -hmm. because you have youth now that are being incarcerated and they are placed in solitary confinement and they cannot handle it. A lot of them are taking their lives um, in solitary confinement. It doesn't, it doesn't even come close to 40 years that he has spent in 23 hour lockdown. Within six months, you could see some uh, mental um, un instability with these youth who are, or either uh, adults who are placed in 23-hour lockdown. It's inhumane, and it's not for anyone. I can tell you I haven't really had an opportunity to have physical contact with my dad since around the age of seven or nine years old. Between that time, our visit... Um, from that time to now have been behind glass. Um, I can remember going to the prisons as a, a young kid and I thought they were this just because I didn't really know my dad was in prison. So I thought that they were these real, well manicured uh, campuses, you know, um, and I would go in because at that time the prisons were more um, about educating um, the prisoners. You're talking 30 something years ago. There was education. Um, when you went into the waiting rooms, there were sites where the kids, the, the children, would have reading time. There were daycare like little rooms set up for the kids that were visiting their parents. So I just thought of it as this great place to go and visit my dad. I just knew he was far away somewhere. It wasn't until I say I was about 11 years old, I realized my dad was in prison. And I had gotten these 50 cent pieces for Christmas from my uncle. And I unfortunately mailed one to my dad without knowing about money orders and stuff like that. And when I when he called, I said, did you get my 50 cent piece for Christmas? He said, oh baby, don't do that. You know, one of the guards took it. And they changed my whole theory about this prison thing. I said, the guards, but they were so nice when I was there, was there, you know, they had these little waiting rooms. And after that time, I had vowed that day that they weren't going to take another thing from my dad. That outside of this well campus, I thought, I knew these people weren't right. And I said to myself, the first visit that I get to see him again, and I didn't tell anyone else this, I was going to get the first guard. 
thinking, you know, I could do this. And got to the prison, my aunt made the call, you'll be visiting your dad. So I was like, okay, and I still held that inside. Got to the prison, I kicked the first guard I seen in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> and I was carried out of that prison under with both arms and they said you won't see your dad today mm -hmm. i said that's okay because you know i got my point across i realized you <laughs> guards aren't the people that i thought you were and that you took my dad's money and they said is this what this is about no your dad is not going to get anything and i didn't get to see my dad that day and my dad when i thought about some oh, guy he must be worried and he told me he said after i knew you would be in my corner. So here I am, mm. still in his corner. But mm. we're talking some 40 years. Mm. Now, I'm well above 40 years of age now. So it's been most of my life. So what we have begun is a campaign to release him from solitary confinement. Yeah. Um, we're trying to make that happen also inside our communities. Russell Schultz began a campaign, an organization called the Human Rights Coalition Group out of Philadelphia, HRC Philadelphia, and it's a HRC Pittsburgh fed up. Right. And what we wanted to do was go into com communities and organize branches in different states and um, build up a family movement against this prison system. Now, it's been a difficult task. It really has because, um, as I say often, family members who have loved ones in prisons are overwhelmed with so much other stuff. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a school system that they're tolerating that don't care anything about our youth. So you got parents who are dealing with the youth that are in the streets or just not being properly educated. So we're still working on that. HRC um, is still um, trying to connect with the prisoners and their loved ones outside. Now, I see some folks here also from the Carcerate PA. That's another organization that just rose up and is some good people um, that are in this organization. I brought our petition for the Carcerate PA also mm -hmm. because what we're trying to do in Pennsylvania is stop the building of additional prisons. That's right. Our state okay. wants to and, um, create three more. And then one of them, they're expanding, what they're doing is expanding uh, in a prison that already exists, greater for they trying to add what 200 400 beds for women so uh, wait a minute right there that says you're looking at our women now mm -hmm. not only have you waged war against our youth now you are just going to take the whole backbone of our community away and that's our women mm -hmm. that is what forced me to join this organization we have our own platform for the, our governor of Pennsylvania which states no more prison you put this money into education. Well, you educate those prisoners coming home. You give them job skills before they come home. There's a whole lot of you can do with what, $600 million? Mm -hmm. We're talking about on three new prisons. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. it, it just takes that. We step up our game. You're here now, and maybe some of you are associated with other organizations. We must step up our game. We can no longer allow these folks to do what they are doing. We are bigger than they ever will be. But they have to ride it. They have to test it and see how much will we take. Oh, they, they're going to ride that thing because money, um, prisons are, is money now. It's big business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I also admire what she's doing. And I'm going to end on that note. She's also working with women, and that's our community. Whether it be here in the States or wherever, we all connect on any le or every level. We're talking about two uh, folks here, Pam Africa from Amia. Mm -hmm. We must not stop that fight. No, no, no. People begin to think, oh, he's in population. The same thing happened some time ago when people thought he just went to death row and that was going to be it. And folks kind of drop back and say, okay, well, he, we saved his life. But we really didn't save his life because no one is saved if they're still behind bars. That is not life no. behind bars. Right. So we must fight to re-release our, our family members, our prisoners, our loved ones, our political prisoners, and with that, whichever organization that you can step in with and be a part of, do it. Amen.
I want to mention, uh, because you mentioned Mumia, I had to mention Leonard Peltier. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read a sentence from something he wrote last year and that we have to take on board. He said, I am honored that the most powerful government has considered me a challenge that they would violate all their own laws to keep me in prison. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're not forgetting Leonard, and he's not so near us, but we have to incorporate him in what we do. Native Americans, we uh, each of us <coughs> from the United States in particular have a responsibility to Native Americans mm. right. because we're here because they're not. Mm -hmm. And we have to always bear that in mind. It clearly states a caste system. So you're talking about thousands of black men being arrested and coming home with that title of a felon. And there's no work for them. So right there, before the second chapter, we're creating a community of folks and this is throughout the country who will not have an opportunity to receive proper wages. We're talking about people going third world. Uh, in fact, this whole thing is going third mm -hmm. world. But if you get an opportunity to read her book, that, that was so key to me. That's the first thing that stopped me in my tracks. And I really admire the step that she's taken. Mm -hmm.